Hi everyone, my name is Alex. I'm an engineer and my passion is design, development and prototype production of all sorts of engineering solutions. Sorry if I'm talking a bit funny here, but I bit my tongue all the way in the back and it doesn't want to heal properly. <laughs> anyway, I guess that's, that's the way how she goes sometimes. This episode is about custom rubber way wipers that are made for the bad slide of the MCOB 13 lathe in order to upgrade from the original felt type way wipers. Now there's nothing wrong with felt type way wipers. They have some advantages over the rubber way wipers which I'm going to cover in this video. But on the other hand, the rubber way wipers may be more reliable and more easy to deal with on a long term basis. And that's why I wanted to do this upgrade. And since I thought this may be a topic that's not just troubling me, but also some of you guys, I thought I should make this video. So in case you're interested how I made these way wipers, join me, why not? <laughs> now you may think that the felt wipers are outdated and the rubber wipers are better in every regard. Um, however, that's not true because uh, there is one quality of the felt wipers which the rubber wipers don't have and you can see it when I tighten those screws You can see they act as an oil wick and By this they make sure that there is at least some kind of uh, some amount of lubrication between bed and the bed slide Which the rubber rubber wipers don't if you do not oil the bed slide from the inside through the oiling ports when you have installed rubber wipers and then you cannot make sure that there is oil or proper lubric lubrication between the bed slide and the bed. With the felt wipers, that's not the case. So, over the years I've re replaced them and made new ones from time to time out of these polishing pads because felt of that thickness can be very expensive if you buy them in sheets. But these polishing pads, they're really cheap and that's an, a, a nice way to to get a hold of this felt material. However, there's one big problem with the felt wipers and that is there is almost no way that you can tell if the wipers are worn down and don't do their job anymore. So, let me just take this one off. So, there's almost no way of making sure of being able to tell from the outside that there is not too much wear on here so that they do not touch anymore. That's very difficult to tell and the only way to come by this is to replace them regularly. However, that's why I'd like to try the rubber wipers because I oil regularly through the oiling ports and then the bed slide should be better off than with the felt wipers even, even if you change the felt wipers regularly. So with this particular way geometry that the MCOV13 lathe uses there is no ready off-the-shelf standard rubber way wiper that we can purchase and just install here. <laughs> so rather we have to make our own way wiper that consists of three individual straight pieces on a carrier plate that we want to install here with these original bolt holes. And the uh, rubber way wiper material I ordered for this purpose is this one here. It's the smallest cross section that I could find for this uh, suiting this purpose. And you see it's a springy rubber lip vulcanized all the way around this stainless steel carrier, carrier strip. And we will arrange three individual pieces here on a carrier plate. Uh, to be mounted on this location. Now the particular type I ordered is this one here in case you uh, wonder and that's the company I ordered it from, it's a German company not affiliated with them, I paid the full price but the product is good and I'm really happy with it set me back another, what is this, 17 euros <laughs> well the only thing to keep in mind when you work this material is it, it works very well to cut it with the hacksaw and clean up the cut with the belt sander. However, when you, you, when you do this, you must be careful not to put too much heat into the, the cut 
because then when you put too much heat in it, the rubber delaminates from the stainless steel backing strip. And this is not a fault of the product, it's just the nature of this rubber and steel uh, vulcanization here. And don't get fooled and don't believe that the, the bond is weak, because when I when I pull here this really doesn't this doesn't come off easy is what I'm trying to say here this one was also heated when I cleaned up that cut so that's why it's delaminated but it holds really well uh, that bond between the steel and the rubber and the other thing to keep in mind now is next step is designing this backing plate is we must preload this rubber lip a certain with a certain displacement so that it can properly clean the way from dirt and the, the recommended preload for, for this particular type here is half a millimeter up to a millimeter and we have to carefully measure bolt hole location geometry and make sure that in the final design the the way wiper is set in a particular uh, uh, position so that the preload of the lip is guaranteed. So I'm not going to take you along in the design process because it's pretty boring but let's see how I made this particular backing plate here. <laughs> so here I'm starting with the Walter UTA dividing head tilted all the way up and with a piece of 7075 T6 leftover material. It's a bit short but we will handle and this is roughing out the rectangular shape with a plain old high-speed steel end mill. And for finishing I'm using a slight bit of mist lubrication just to get rid of the chips so that the chips are not cut, are not cut multiple times but rather just once. And a slight bit of mist lubrication makes sure that the, that the chips don't tend to stick so much to the to the end mill. So you see, there's no flooding here. It's just the appropriate amount of lubrication that's required here. Here I'm uh, radius interpolation milling with the function of the DRO. Of course, this is just interpolation of the radii and it gives some facets but I don't care about the facets, the radii are not functional and they give uh, a appeal to the part that I kind of like. So now let's tilt to 30 degrees to machine the large chamfer. That's why this setup with the dividing head is so comfortable for, for such small pieces. I'm finishing generally by climb milling gives a better surface finish. Now back to the reference zero degree position and now we have to machine out that V shape that will allow this carrier to sit on the way eventually. And here I'm double and triple checking that I'm making the right symmetrical piece and not just the second one. <laughs> Don't ask me why I triple check this. <laughs> and I'm marking it with the old felt holding plate. And just doing this with the felt pen to give me a rough idea how far I have to rough cut by hand cranking. And next are the holes for the rivets and the holes for mounting the plate. So let's do the mounting holes first. And you may note that the spotting process takes me a little time because I'm setting the quill to zero here in order to spot drill to a certain depth. A depth that will give a spot that is slightly larger than the hole so thereby, after drilling the hole, we already have a chamfer and save one step in the machining process. It's a bit more thinking ahead, but a little less work. So 
same here, going to the depth that already will give a chamfer after drilling. And drilling the mounting hole here. Those mounting holes, they have little tolerance on the screw diameter, just to make sure that we have the proper preload on the rubber lips. It's not perfectly adequate. For tight tolerance location, but it's good enough for the rubber lips. So next, let's go to the drilling coordinates of the rivets. Hot drilling is first. I'm not bothering about the precise depth here because we will machine a, a step to locate the rubber wipers anyway after this of course so this is drilling the rivet holes according to coordinates and now let's turn the dividing head to 25 degree position and machine the step so what I'm doing here is I'm setting I'm locating the end mill at the corner point and setting a new origin here so then during the machining of the step I just have to aim for the zero zero coordinate and I don't have to keep in mind a lot of coordinates I just set the origins once and then machine to the zero zero position it's way less prone to error than keeping a lot of coordinates in mind in my opinion at least <laughs> So, same here, going to the corner point coordinate, setting a new origin, and then I just have to aim for a zero, 0 position. Now let's plunge down, and rough it out. The end mill I'm using here is a 2mm diameter 4 fluid carbide end mill. On aluminum it doesn't matter if it's carbide or, or uh, high-speed steel. The carbide is just what I had and it's nice because it deflects less than the high-speed steel end mills. I'm not even going a finishing pass here. Depth of cut I'm doing one millimeter, that's half the diameter of the end mill. Works nicely. Mist cooling here is very important to get the chips away from the end mill and make sure that the chips are not smashed onto the surface again and cut twice or even more. And the, the mist lubrication makes sure that the chips don't stick so much. I'm just happy that the chuck jaws are patient and don't open up by themselves because they feel that way. <laughs> so I machined the second leg of camera. Same procedure. So all that's left now is to hog out this, this piece here and this piece here. And here we have to be careful about the coordinates of the corner points to have uh, a proper transition from this edge into this edge into this edge. So going back to the zero degree reference position, easy with the direct indexing disc of the ball to dividing head. And now let's set us some new origins in the corner points. We had those before, but with the dividing head tilted respectively, so we have to set some new ones. Alright, so lubrication and compressed air is on. That's too much. Just a tiny bit. Plunging down to the step depth. And finishing out that corner. Careful, careful, ah, okay, 
same procedure here. Careful, careful. Don't forget to stop. Ah, it should work. All right. So now let's cut off that part from the arbor and what I'm using here is a 2mm high speed steel saw blade, it's got 100mm diameters and I'm touching off the Z height here and setting the DRO to plus 2 so that now I just have to go to the thickness of the part in minus C direction. However, I have to be careful here not to hit the jack jaws. <laughs> That's what you get when you cheap out on the leftover material. <laughs> so I'm taking 2 millimeter depth of cuts here. I'm not daring to go much deeper because the tooth spacing on that saw blade is quite narrow and then you only have limited volume of chips to be stored between the teeth. Believe it or not, every time I send out the saw blade for resharpening, I ask for taking out every second tooth <laughs> or every, every other tooth, but I always get it back the same way it was. It's like I'm asking for a kidney or something, I don't know. <laughs> but it's the same principle as with the band saws. With narrowly spaced teeth, you only have limited volume of chips that can be stored between the teeth before tooth comes out of the part again so this can lead to severe problems also making sure here with the mist cooling to blow out the chips from in between the teeth it's very important with the saw blades and that's it so off to the hand deburring cycles Mostly hand deburring. I will spare you most because that's uh, sleep inducing, I'm guessing. So we should be able to work with that, I guess. I already hear the sleeping noises. Sorry, guys, but it's just. Uh, it's over now. So chamfering the holes on the forward side is just a good practice. But on the back side we have to chamfer the holes quite precisely to accommodate the rivet heads, countersunk rivet heads. And I don't know about you but there's nothing I hate more than protruding countersunk heads or countersunk heads that are too low or uh, countersunk too deep so <laughs> I'm taking my time here trying to be precise particularly with rivets a too deep countersink is a a really bad thing big chamfers I'm doing with my beloved chamfer tool so let's open the clamp and set it deeper we could because we want three clicks more that's 0.3 of a millimeter more in chamfer size Is it safe? <sighs> in case you're interested in this tool, I have a video on this tool. I made this because I grew so sick of chamfering the many lightning holes in sheet metal parts. And ever since then, I use it all the time on pieces like these. To get consistent large chamfer size with good surface quality. And the nice thing about this deburring tool is that you can consume, uh, that it uses end mills and not conical mills. So you can consume all the circumference of that end mill be before you have to replace it. And that's the, the nice thing, it's very economical that tool on the, on the end mills. So, should work out, I guess.
So now for this uh, nasty short corner piece here with the very narrow uh, holes. So I'm drilling according to coordinates here, at least distances between the hole and distance from the back edge that I'm using to register the part here in this little jig so that we only have to hand grind to the belt sander the angles where the parts intersect but everything else is machined and good tolerance thereby Uh, this uh, carrier strip on the rubber way wiper material is stainless steel so I'm making sure to put some lubrication on the drill. The drill is 2 mm diameter, the rivets are also 2 mm diameter. No need to ream this here because the, rivet ex the, the solid rivets do expand in their holes. That's a big benefit in contrast to the blind rivets. Now we have to poke through the rubber on the back side because I don't want to, to drill too much into that little jig here. So that's it. And now let's chamfer the holes. Hit the camera. So this is just chamfering the rubber. So in order to keep myself from a lot of trouble I printed some stencils for cutting the parts from the CAD model and I'm aligning here the stencil with the holes that we just drilled according to the coordinates so that we will have hopefully little trouble to grind these, um, these corners. It's a little iffy with that tiny template to align it with with the holes here but the principle is sound I think if you're patient and now I'm using just a plain old knife to mark the rubber And I'm cutting the rubber on the back side all the way down to the stainless steel strip. It's a nasty tiny piece, all right. So I'm trying to cut the lip at first so that uh, we do not put too much load on the vulcanization or on the bond between the stainless steel and the rubber. Yes, it's stainless steel, all right, and my saw and my hacksaw blade is not new. <laughs> And this is the way how I finish those cuts. The belt I'm using here is just a torn off piece of a 3M Trisect finishing belt. I use a narrow torn off piece here because it's, it's just more convenient because you don't have to mind your fingers so much. And I'm using a very slow belt speed here to keep the part from heating up too much. We've already discussed this. And I have to fiddle around here with the light because otherwise I can't see that scoring mark from the knife that we just made before. But uh, here it should work, I think.
and always keep the part from overheating. And I'm using a little pressure here just to make sure that the lips also grind properly. So let's see if that fits. Mm, doesn't look all too bad. Yes, that's good. Oh, nice. Nice. So it's also important to note that the lip is not um, squashed together because it was it didn't deflect too much during the grinding process. So there's not too much material here, but also not too little. Nice. Should work. Yeah. Let me do the other one off camera, and then we start the riveting process. All right. So. Parts are now fitted and the uh, fitting is quite all right. Lips are not squashed, they are not delaminated, so heat was okay during the sanding or grinding process. Now, since these rivets I purchased long, I didn't purchase them the the particular the required length for the job at hand. Uh, we have to shorten them, and you may ask uh, to which length do we shorten them. Well, um, there is a certain trade-off in length. They must not be cut too long because then they tend to lean uh, during the setting process. And we mustn't make it too short because then the strength is inadequate because of the lacking shear strength of a too low head. So in essence, what we usually come up with um, as a cut length is, that's a rough ballpark number. It's not aircraft tolerances. But if we cut it 1.1 to 1.2 times the rivet diameter, so that's 2 millimeter diameter, so we cut it to 2 point something. This sheet metal here is 2.5, so I use this as a spacer. And I take care to very uh, much uh, cut the rivets parallel to the lower surface. And that's it. The parallel cutting is of importance because if you cut it in a crooked fashion, then they, uh, during the initial part of the setting process, they lean uh, toward one side and then you cannot get them straight anymore. So the actual riveting process I'm doing in the mill with the quill, because the forces for these small aluminum rivets, they're so low, it's it's way less than the quill force you have for drilling with a 5mm drill. So standard practice is I'm using a, a perpendicularly ground broken off end mill here in the chuck. And standard practice is I slightly set the rivets first here, only a tiny bit, so that they expand in their hole and make a press fit between the two parts and now I'm using this other tool here it's just a brass tube and I'm using this to pull together the two parts and close any gap that may be between the two parts here so this is standard riveting practice nothing new So now we should have closed any gap that may have been there. Now let's go back to the riveting punch, that broken off end mill. And let's set the rivets now. And I try to be very much on center most of the times, unless I have a slightly leaning rivet, then I try to go 
the other side of the punch to lean it a slightly bit back. The longer the rivets are pre-cut, the, the more difficult this is. And then I set the rivets so that the rivet head diameter is one point, roughly 1.5 times the rivet shank diameter. That's standard dimensions. So, almost done. Now we just have to trim off the excess parts of the way wiper material and make sure not to overheat the stainless steel strip. So finally let's glue the lips together and I use this, uh, the writing has come off, this is uh, rubber toughened Loctite super glue, I don't remember the number, I'll put it down in the description. So. All right, it should work nice to keep the dirt out. Almost finished, now we just have to machine free that hole here and then we can mount them. So using the dial test indicator here to find the center of the hole in the backing plate and then we machine it out with the end mill just to make sure that the hole doesn't walk away which would happen if we were using a twist drill for example uh, just to make sure that the hole stays where it is per design so that the lip preload will be adequate Nice. The pressure when I'm lubricating by hand feels uh, a little higher now, which is a really good sign. 
and we can see no oil emerging from the lips but rather from the sides which is also a great sign so that looks really good you may not be able to see this on camera you can see here the oil is flowing and you can see here and it may be uh, shielded from this uh, sheet here but the oil is coming out on the sides here as well so it works nicely and in contrast to the felt wipers with the rubber wipers we have a good uh, method to tell if they're working as they're supposed to let's see you were pushing away some oil and now when I go back let's see the reflection and you can see there are no ridges of oil that I'm dragging it's just a homogeneous and smooth layer of oil that we're leaving behind and that way we can tell that, that the rubber wipers are really doing a nice job and working as they're supposed to all right guys thanks a lot for your interest in this video i appreciate your time all the best and see you on the next one